I'm already in, in a trembling state because when you, when they, someone calls you and say, would you fill Brother Bob's shoes or take Brother Bob's place, you start to tremble. And so if I clammed up a little bit in trying to share that opening numbers because I, I knew I couldn't do it, but I was willing. I was willing. And so are you. Uh, thank you, Jillian, for that taking that number there. Beautiful, beautiful number. I want to share, uh, as it, what, by way of introduction, because of her song, I want to share uh, something that I've alluded to before and you've probably heard about, or maybe you've heard about. But uh, I remember that that was the song that was being sung in England at an evangelistic campaign. And... Um, I guess God was working something like he did with Billy Graham. This wasn't Billy, it was another evangelist, and the Lord was stirring London. And um, the witches who had their meeting places were trying to uh, jinx the meeting, trying to throw a spell. They actually do have power. And uh, the chief of the witches of Europe was a woman by the name of Diana, and so po so powerful she was that she actually walked through the fire in hand with the devil who materialized. He chose her. So we don't know much about that kind of, those kind of stories, but that actually happened. And she walked through the fire with him, and she had such faith in him, and she worshipped him. Uh, she had done such unusual powers, Diana did, that birds fly. She could simply strike them from flight. They'd die, fall to the ground. She also could do, when the authorities got to looking for her and her witches, she could also pull down an invisible shield. They just walked past them and never saw them. And that kind of power I've not heard about, but I know she had it. And it's written in her book, From Christ, no, From Witchcraft to Christ, I believe it's called. And it's been many years since I thought of it until I loaned it to a friend of mine uh, in the, the, the gathering congregation. Um, but I remember that she and the other witches became so disturbed over what was happening that she set out in a uh, r r very worldly, she was a prostitute and a person on drugs and had these great powers. And she set out to this meeting to put a spell. She said, I'm going after this fellow and I'm going to be in his presence and I'm going to, you know, come against him in this meeting. And so she came. She wasn't very welcome because she looked more than worldly. She didn't care. She was defiant. But she came into the meeting, and somewhere in the course of the meeting, the singer of the hour began to sing this song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And suddenly, she felt the call of Jesus. Suddenly, she was being called. And she listened to the singer. She said the singer was so pure and so beautiful, and she said, Surely Jesus doesn't care for me like that. But the song and the anointing and the call of Christ said that he did. He was telling her he did love her like that. Yeah. And so she was in a battle. And being almost persuaded to go forward after he called her and give her life to Christ, the devil spoke out loud and said, flee here at once. Get out of here. And she almost did. But then she could hear the words of this song, No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And in that great moment of battle, she yielded to the voice of Christ. And she went forward and gave her life. She said she repented of her sins. Now that was probably the most unwelcome convert in the, in the city of London. Because the saints didn't want anything to do with her. 
she didn't know how to act or how to dress, and so she wore what she'd been wearing, which is, was whirly, whatever that is. And, uh, and, but on the way home, through the city of London that night, through the red light district, she would, she would wave at her friends and say, Jesus saved me. They said, what? Jesus saved me. I belong to Jesus. And she made her witness on the way home. Amen. Now, be careful. The struggle was so great in her soul that she didn't immediately get out of prostitution. You see, that would eliminate her from most all of our companies. But not Jesus. Nor did she immediately quit drugs. But you know something? Jesus never left her. He stayed right with her. Amen. And the story of her life is now recorded. I think Thomas Nelson did it er, uh, late in the later years, and I have that book. But in the earlier years, I remember the Lutheran publishing company Concordia had her, the story of her life. And the battle between how she became entirely free is recorded because she still had things attached to her that she couldn't get rid of, and yet... Christ was with her. And, and, and then, I don't, I don't remember the story that well myself, but I do remember the scripture, greater is he that w is within you than he that is without. The Lord captured her life, won completely in her life, and she became an evangelist in Europe. I heard her on a radio station in Annapolis. I remember saying, uh, her saying over the commands of Christ, she said, his she said, you know, I always obeyed the devil and did what he said. But how much more joyous it is to obey Christ. And she said, what Jesus says is never grievous. I, I heard this joy. I heard this love. And God cleaned this woman up, made her pure within, took her out of drugs, took her out of prostitution, and took her away from the devil himself and made her his. But she heard that call that night. Yeah. And what a call that was. That opens up the scripture, which is last week's scripture, um, from Mark, concerning this very thing, the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Mark 1, we, re we reread this account. After John was put in prison... Jesus went in the Galilee. Huh. Galilee. Two hundred and four cities. Herod Antipas had charge of two hundred and four cities. That's, he got the revenue off all those cities. And after he got his, or after he paid Rome, got Caesar's hit, then he had his. Then he got revenue out of everything. Every time you passed a bridge, went through a certain section of one country or the other, every time you fished, you paid Matthew. There's toll collectors and tax collectors everywhere, and it all poured into Antipas's treasury. Galilee, when we were there, looked so pastoral and serene. It's a, it's a beautiful place but not so much in the time of Christ. It was not Jerusalem, it was not Sepphoris, and it was not Tiberias. And it's notable that he stayed out of those cities, Sepphoris, which was Antipas' capital. When you're at Nazareth and you look, you see Sepphoris right over there. There it is, three and a half miles away. Tiberias, built later and during the life of Christ, was built down on the Sea of Galilee and indeed the sea itself. Oh, by the way, that's hyperbole. That's no sea, that's a lake. But I like the hyperbole, don't you? How can it be any different? You go up there, don't, don't tell me, don't call it the Lake of Galilee, tell me the Sea of Galilee. I've been raised on the, the term the Sea of Galilee. It's only, what, 12 miles, 12 by 6, or 12 by 7, or 13 by 7, at its, um, in its largest areas. It's just a small place. 
And jo- Josephus said at one time, he sat on the banks and looked out over Galilee and he counted 300 fishing vessels. I just, I've been musing over Galilee. I love it. And I've been singing the song, The Stranger of Galilee. And I thought I could love him forever. The Stranger of Galilee. And indeed he was. Sent to this land, by the way, around the Sea of Galilee were around 18 cities, more than 15,000. A lot of people of all nationalities. Greeks, Jews, and others. (laughs) All in that area. Christ came because it was said that those who were in Naphtali and Zebulon would see a great light, Isaiah said. And God sent that light into Galilee, and what a stir it was. But after John was thrown in prison, or handed over, as the Greek says, later it would say that our Lord was handed over. There's a, there's a sermon there all of its own. There's a time, and I think I mentioned it last week, there's a time when our ministry ceases and we're handed over. God hasn't lost the battle. There's a time when our mission stops and we're handed over to powers that seem to be utterly destructive. But God hasn't lost the battle. In this case, when John was handed over, it just simply sent our Lord into Galilee to minister. And while he walked, and the Greek says, while he was passing by, and when I read it this week, I said, Jesus, where were you going? So he's headed somewhere else. But while he's passing by, he sees some men fishing. And if you read the full context and put the four Gospels together, he's going from, he's going from, oh, Cana in, to Capernaum, if you put them together. But he's passing by. And I just, I just love to muse over it. He's passing by. And he sees Peter and Andrew, Jewish people who have Greek names, Simon, Simon's Greek, Andrew's Greek, but they're Jews. Tells you how Hellenized the area was and how popular uh, the Latin names and the uh, the names that, uh, what's his name, Constantine, had brought into the territory were. But he sees them and he loves them. Last week we almost could feel that love as Jesus stood on the shore. And then he does something very strange. He calls them. Follow me. Come after me. That had never been done in all of Israel. In Israel, Even today, the students choose their rabbis. The rabbi does not choose the students. And he's standing on shore. They haven't made their, they haven't made the choice. They've heard of him. In John, you can see some of the background. They're no doubt interested. They're challenged and whatever else. But they hadn't gotten together to choose their rabbi. And the rabbi's passing by the Sea of Galilee. And he looks out of it and he says, Come, follow me. What an impact. How different. There's something so dissimilar about it. And it thrills me to think of what, might, what they might have felt at the moment. Because when that call went out, I am sure they felt what Doreen felt. They felt the call of the Holy Spirit within the heart. I was just sitting on the front seat one night. I was only six years old. A lady preacher was preaching, a beautiful, wonderful person by the name of Sister Laura May Winfold. And she was telling, I can't remember what, I just know it was the gospel. She was preaching, and toward the end of it, my heart began to bound. I couldn't have told you the theology of it. It didn't matter. I just knew Jesus was calling me. And Jesus, the call came in like he did to those by the Sea of Galilee. I was only six years old. Doreen was much older. 
The disciples were much older, but Jesus called me at six years of age. I'm sitting there, and my heart's pounding, and I felt the weight of my sins. I really did. And while the altar call was being given, because we were old-fashioned Methodists in theology, and we had a mourner's bench, and while we were going forward, and I fell in at an altar prayer, I was completely unnoticed. They were happy over well, this one got the victory, and 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 I got the victory, but there's nobody there to shout with me. I was just thought to be too young, except my mother and father. And when I came up from there, I had a light on my face. I had the joy in my heart. Jesus had called me to be one of his. Amen. And I got up from there, and I wanted to. T I wanted the witness. I wanted to tell people. Nobody was interested, but mom and dad. You know what? You know what? It was good enough. If mom and dad knew, it was good enough for me. And so I said, "Oh, mama, Jesus saved me." She said, "Son, I know it. I know it. Daddy and I are very happy." Amen. Down on their knees, they went, put their arms around me, Amen. and I'm telling you, talk about one happy six-year-old. He was. I was one happy six-year-old. And even in those early days, I would tell the stories of Jesus to neighbors. <laughs> I didn't even know I was called to be a preacher. But somehow, Mom and Dad knew it, because I'd get, get up on a chair. And I don't know if the neighbors believed in God or not, but I told them about Jesus, and I told them, and I didn't even think of preaching. I was just so excited. I witnessed. I declared how wonderful he was and shared the things of God. I was a... Pretty regular talker, because I remember coming home. The teacher told something about blackbirds one day. I don't remember the story, but I just remember it was blackbirds. And I was so fascinated with that, I headed over to the neighbors. I said, hey, "Everybody, stop everything! I got a story." Yeah. And they were kind to me, and they stopped. And I got up on the chair, and I said, mm -hmm, "Let me tell you this." And they just listened to the children fascinatedly. I had kind people around me, people that nourished me and helped me. But oh, the call of Jesus. Jesus called me. Listen, let me tell you something. You, if you don't choose him, he chooses you. We don't ask him to be our rabbi. He chooses us. And there's a scripture for that. He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Yeah. And I know God's given that to Brother Helm and to East Stanley Jones and and others, I know that. But let me tell you something: that is Christ, that is church wide. We've not chosen Him; He's chosen us, and He's called us because He loves us. And I've often thought I, earlier in my life, I was a little like I'm a little like Richie in some things, and a whole lot like Richie in other things. I just ask a question out of the clear blue. He's got me working on a question right now. There's going to be a sermon one of these days. By God's grace, I'm working on it, Richie. But, but I said, Jesus, Jesus, uh, I love him because he first loved me. I said, that sounds unfair. I love him because he first loved me? See, I didn't know. I didn't realize before I was ever born he died for me. He shed his blood for me, of course. And I, but I love him because he first loved me. And that night that he, my mom and dad taught about him, I fell in love by the hearing of what Jesus was and how he was and also what I, what I experienced in my mother and daddy. I felt Jesus. I felt Jesus. He was so wonderful. I, I've told you about how that after about nine years of age, um, we mom and dad would sometimes have devotions with us and sometimes they'd send us to bed to have our own and so i was the oldest so i led the way and i had that's before gavin was born he was gavin 17 years younger than i am so it was many years before gavin came but i remember being in the room and uh i would say now boys you're going to have a service together here i said uh, ronnie uh, you sing something for us ronnie just a little thing he couldn't even talk plain. And I remember him singing, uh, um, Jesus, Mother Mary tucked him in, warmed his tiny feet, sang a wah-wah-bye to him, sweet my baby sweep. I remember 
Johnny singing that. When he's just a little thing, it's just so sweet in that room. And I said, now, Terry, you lead us in prayer. The boys did what I said. <laughs> I know Terry that did the best he could. Just us boys. And then I'd preach a little. And then we'd have a closing prayer. And then the boys would fall asleep. Sometimes they fell asleep during the service. But it was sweet. And after they'd go to sleep, Jesus would enter the room. And there he was. And I'd look up at him. He'd be right there. I couldn't see him. It was years later before I ever saw him. But I knew he was there. And I'd say, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you're so wonderful. Oh, Jesus, thank you for coming. Oh, Jesus. And then I'd try to quiet down. The glory of God would get stronger. I'd say, Jesus, I sat up in bed. I didn't know you were this wonderful. Oh, Jesus. And finally, you just got to share it with somebody. I'd leap out of bed, go into mom and dad's room, wake them up and say, Mom and dad, Jesus is in the room. Oh, daddy, he's so wonderful. My daddy was so wise. He would listen to me. Son, how wonderful that is. Now you go back. And you be with him. As long as you feel him there, you stay with him. You talk to him. It was so great. don't know how many times, a few times in my younger years that Jesus came. Oh, the call of Jesus. Oh, the call of Jesus. He, he was passing by. God's got wonderful things to do over the world it's true and the, but the intellectuals think that those that believe in him think he has so many things to do he doesn't have time to stop by it says here while he was passing by he saw Simon and he saw his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake now that in the Greek is a small net and they were probably standing on the edge of the shore they weren't as wealthy as the Zebedee family and so they were connected, but not as wealthy. So they're casting these small nets and catching the fish the best they could. And so while they're cast, casting these small nets, <laughs> they hear Jesus say, Come after me. Come follow me. And then they hear something. And I will make you fishers of men. Now listen. Not only did you not choose, your, I mean, not only did your rabbis not choose you, you chose your rabbis. But when you chose them, they told they would do you this, they would make you students of, of Torah. They were going to make you students. Here's another dissimilarity. He didn't say any such thing. The one who wrote the word from Genesis to Revelation, or would be writing it, because it was yet to appear, the one who wrote the word doesn't say, I'm going to teach you the word of God. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Christianity is relational. Christianity is not primarily, um, it, is not, it is not a religion of paper. All religions are religions of paper. But Christianity is a religion of a person. I often say theology is to explain what happens between me and God and what ought to be between you and me. Fishers of men. Another dissimilarity was that the fishers of men was a negative thing in the Old Testament. Jeremiah said, God said, I will send fishermen out to bring you to judgment. And there's no positive reference in the Old Testament. But when Jesus came, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. And it's all in the context of positiveness. I will make you fishers of men. That call came that day. That call, I don't know what happened, but if their heart beat like mine, something happened because they responded immediately, Mark says, and they responded forthrightly, and they left their nets. Well, he went on a little further. They left their small nets and went a little further, and it said they were mending their nets, and it's large nets, the drag nets you put behind the boats. And there was Zebedee, and they're in this, this larger fishing boat. And he says to them also, Come follow me. And they left Zebedee, and they left their boats, and they left the mending of their nets. See, there's a negative and a positive in this. When the call of Christ comes to us, there's something to leave, especially self-interest. 
especially self-fulfillment. If you concentrate on that, you're dead in the water from the beginning. Go to, the, go to your libraries today. Self, I mean your, uh, your bookstores. Self-help, 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 self-help. Might be a small section there on religion and inspiration. Barnes & Noble has a pretty good section on it. But more people are interested in self-help. What can I do to help myself? Well, there's one person who can make us what we ought to be. <laughs> His power can make you what you ought to be. His love can make you relate to your wife or your husband or your children like you ought to relate to them. How much do you enjoy Pastor today? I enjoyed him. I just enjoyed him. When he explains he likes a song or when he says uh, something that, that was good or I, I watch that. I feed on that. How, isn't it wonderful? Yeah. How, how, what was it like to watch, watch Jesus do these things? What was it like to watch Jesus take Matthew in his arms and love him after Matthew left all and followed him? Because he gave him the call. He said, follow me also. Oh, I don't know. But I know that when Jesus appeared at the foot of my bed, I know this. Though he didn't speak at that moment, those eyes were so filled with love and, and kindness that I wanted to get out after he left. It came to me, I should have gotten out and got my arms around him. And never have I ever wanted a man's tresses up against me. I'm just all man, you know. But I wanted you to know I wish I could have got my arms around Jesus and felt his hair against mine. And I'm thinking, wonder how many years when I get to heaven will it, well, I don't think it's making difference, eternities forever, but I'm lining up. I see myself lining up because he loved me and he called me and I'm going to get to line up and I'm, I'm going to get my arms around him and I'm going to love him. You know what? He might have to say to me like he did to Mary. Now, Mary, let me go. <laughs> Turn me loose. <laughs> I don't know. The joy, the joy of walking with God. The joy. Just think, he came preaching the kingdom of God has come into history. That's what it means. Come near. The kingdom of God has burst upon the scene. What will you do in response to this king? Well, when he calls, we must answer. Turn away from negative things and give our life entirely to him. It is so puzzling. When we started following Jesus from California to Minnesota to southern Ohio, here into Texas, but let me tell you something, we're here for one reason only, and it's the voice of Jesus Christ. We're here to help his servant. But it was, Jesus, I'd be a fool to come here. I, I, you, I'd just be a fool to leave my mom and daddy. Mom says, last week, son, we miss you being here, but we're happy because we know you're obeying God. By the way, get ready. There's an influx coming. Bobby will be here. Bobby Woodrum, our dear friend, and his daughter will be here in a week and a half. And the next week, your brother, James, will be here, and his wife, Jackie, who's been with us before. And then we just got word that your sister has an airline ticket. She's flying in, and her daughter will be here to be with us. Kelly, who's a beautiful singer like Julia, she has a voice like Julia, she'll be here. And then mom and dad's coming all of September. They're coming to be loved. <laughs> They're coming to hear the voice of Jesus. Amen. They're coming because they've been called to follow him. What a joy. What a privilege. Isn't it wonderful to leave it all in his hands? All we have to do is respond to the call. Oh, we do. It says, follow me. So we follow. We don't have to worry about trying to put a church together. We don't have to worry about building a kingdom. He does it. 
And I said, I said almost uh, shakingly to those students when I was teaching college in Circleville, Ohio, I said, boys and girls, or young men and women, because they were older than boys and girls, I said, listen, God wants a mega church, but he doesn't want to build it the way we're building it. I said, he wants to build one through the power of the Spirit like he did on the day of Pentecost. And then when he builds it, these people that are in our congregations won't be filled with murmuring and criticism. They'll be filled with the love of Jesus. And when they obey God, somehow that call will go out. That call will go out. You can't choose him. He chooses you. You can't. You can't come to Jesus unless the Father calls. But isn't it wonderful that he's called us? Isn't it beautiful? See, within we can hear his voice. I long to hear it out here. Brother Helms heard his voice. I think he said 22 inches from his ear. I thought, oh, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, hallelujah. I haven't heard that. But I had the operation within my heart that he would never leave me nor forsake me. And it's that voice, the one that called me, that keeps on calling. You know what he keeps saying? Follow me. I'll close with this. What was his last, what's Jesus' last words in the gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What's his last word? Well, I'll read them to you. Peter's a little trouble because... Uh, He's a little troubled about John, and he voices his concern. And Peter looks over and says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper, and he said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? What about John? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. That's the last words in the gospel that Jesus spoke. You must follow me. Don't be concerned about what the other person does. Isn't it joy to follow Jesus? It brought you, Cindy. It brought you and Mary Catherine and Amanda to Texas. And we pray for your husband that God will make him well because he came because God's voice spoke to him. Come, follow me. Oh, praise the Lord. Jesus, help us today. Help us not to turn away from that voice. I think I heard Brother Him say he comes to every man at least once in a lifetime, sometimes two, seldom three, and almost never four because he's a just God, and we all get the call. Jesus, we respond, and we keep on responding, for you keep on saying, follow me, and I'll make you what you ought to be. What a joy to leave it all in your hands. Give us, O oh Lord, the help of the Holy Spirit to follow you to the ends of the earth, to Texas, or wherever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.